Okay, hello. Hi there. Hello, hello, how Caroline are you? Andy. How's it going? Good, how are you? Not too bad, thank you. Not too bad at all. All right, are you ready for your send me three questions? Absolutely. So, let's get started. What is your name? My name is Terence O'Keefe. And what is your specialty? Uh, I'm a trauma surgeon by trade, so kind of branch of general surgery. And how many years have you been practicing? Oh, that's a good question. I graduated in, from general surgery 2002 and then finished my trauma fellowship 2005. Started my first faculty job January 2006. So what's that, uh, 15 years? Yeah, the math sounds right. Yes. So where did you go to undergrad or did your undergrad university train? Uh, so slightly different, as you might tell from my accent, I'm originally from Britain. So I uh, started off and I did my uh, medical school in the UK, in Scotland actually, in, uh, in Edinburgh. Um, and we go straight from school to medical school. So we don't do an undergrad, we just have uh, medical school. And it takes slightly longer. In my case, it actually took six years um, because I did an extra degree, but normally it takes five. Okay. So what brought you to the US for your medical career? Uh, I wanted to do trauma surgery. And as I like to joke with people, we, um, we don't have guns in Britain and we drive a little better. Um, so <laughs> we, uh, don't have, uh, uh, we don't really have trauma. Back in those days, the, the, the whole trauma center thing didn't actually exist. Now there are trauma centers in the UK, um, but still trauma is not a big, big thing in the UK. It really isn't. So uh, if I wanted to have this kind of career, um, I needed to come to uh, areas that have trauma centers, which is basically here, South Africa, and Australia, pretty much. Okay. Uh, interesting turn of a uh, career. <laughs> so, I know it's been a bit, but do you remember what was your favorite part of medical school? Uh, my favorite part of medical school? Hmm. That's interesting. I did an intercalated honors year, which was basically I, got an, I took a year and took an extra degree. I spent a lot of time in the lab. Uh, so I spent about six months going in pretty much every day for about uh, that, that period uh, working on a research project, um, which I really enjoyed. However, it did make me realize that um, pathologists are completely crazy. Um, <laughs> and uh, I actually wanted to get back to clinical medicine. And so um, I enjoyed getting back into the actually looking after patient care because I had already, uh, even when I went to medical school, I planned on being a pathologist. So I took a severe uh, a turn at some point in my medical school career. Well, I think that kind of answers my next question, which was, on the first day of med school, what specialty did you think you were going to go into? Yeah, that was pathology. I, I, my father growing up was a family practice doc, and we used to get phone calls routed to the house. And so I very clearly um, decided early on I, didn't, I wanted nothing to do with family practice or general practice, as it's called in the UK. Um, and as, by extension, I thought I didn't want anything to do with actual patient care. For those of you who read The House of God, you talk about the patient care mm -hmm. specialties and non-patient care. I was clearly wanted to be a non-patient care specialty, um, but I changed my mind after spending a year doing pathology. So, were there any other specialties you immediately, out, out the gate, said, not for me? Uh, I'd probably say geriatrics for the same reason. My father used to take me to these, uh, um, these old people's homes in Christmas, uh, and I'd go around and say Merry Christmas to all these, all these people in, uh, in their 80s, 90s in the homes. And, uh, they're, they're wonderful, nice people, but they all, the little old ladies kept on trying to chat me up and pinch my bum. Um, so <laughs> I realized geriatric was definitely something I wasn't going to be going into. That, that's enough to deter you yes. from the field. <laughs> well, let's get back to where you are now. So what made you first fall in love with trauma surgery? Uh, did, I, did I fall in love with trauma surgery or did I just choose trauma surgery? <laughs> Um, I, I didn't know about trauma surgery. I actually was in my final year of medical school and I was trying to make up my mind. I was ruling out various things and I was kind of coming down to anesthesia, pediatrics, ER. I hadn't really even actually considered surgery. But I met someone who had um, worked at MedStar in Washington, D.C. He was actually in the military and he told me about this thing called trauma surgery, which I'd never heard of. Uh, and I had no plans to come to the United States, like zero. This was not in my game plan at all. Um, and when I found out about that, I started researching it and I realized that's kind of what I wanted to do. Because uh, not only do you do surgery, you also look after patients in the ICU and you also have sort of pre-hospital and public health and injury prevention roles. So it, it encompassed everything that, that kind of was quite exciting. Absolutely. Now, for those who are interested in being in your shoes one day, at least in the American system, how many years of training after medical school does it take? So basically, you've got to do your five years of general surgery residency, and then after that, you can either do a one or two year fellowship. 
Um, I did a two-year fellowship. What you really need is the surgical critical care portion, which is the added certificate. That's actually an extra qualification, um, all regulated by the ACGME. Um, and the second year is, is a less regulated fellowship. There are various different types. Um, some people use that time to get more clinical experience. Some people can get further research degrees. I actually did an MPH during my two years in, uh, in Miami. Um, but there's various different ways of going about it. But yes, you have to add a couple of years at the end of it. But considering most general surgery residences, about 80 or 90% of general surgery residents now go into some form of fellowship, it's not really that, that big of a deal. And it's actually interesting, my specialty, acute care surgery, which is kind of what we call it now, it's kind of this all-encompassing trauma surgery plus general surgery plus ICU, um, is actually seeing a, a rise in the number of applicants and up to 40% up to of, of um, general surgery residents are actually choosing that for fellowship. Okay. And you mentioned that there are a couple of subspecialties even within trauma surgery. So can you elaborate on what are the options? Yeah, so, so most people don't typically hyper-specialize. I mean, that would be hyper-specializing. But surgical critical care is, is uh, part of my job. And so it's, uh, what, the way we, have, uh, we work things here is basically you have times when you're on call for trauma. There are times when you're doing emergency general surgery. And there are times when you're doing ICU. Um, there are, I imagine, some people out there who are just doing ICU right now, but most of us are doing this, uh, this whole mix. And some pl people in various places actually have a significant elective practice as well. So to a certain extent, you can kind of tailor it a little bit. It's more tailored by where you're working and how the job is structured rather than necessarily how you control it. Um, but there are different ways of, of doing that. So you can, uh, and again, it's the variety. So for example, last week I was on night shift and I was on 12 hour night shift, Monday through Sunday. I looked after general surgical operations, I looked after trauma. Um, we had a guy who came in who was, who was trying to bleed to death out of his chest, took him to the OR, saved his life, he did great. Um, had a patient that came with perforated ulcer, took him to the OR. Jury's out yet, he's still, he's still recovering. Um, but then this week I'm just doing academic things, I'm catching up with my paperwork, I'm working on research projects, I'm working on performance improvement for the trauma program. Um, and then uh, next week I'll be doing rounding on the floor, then I'll be going to the ICU. So it's, it's all, it's kind of how you're, you're set up, but um, you have the option to have a very varied existence uh, as a trauma surgeon, which is good. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned you actually got a MPH. I did, I got a master's, actually a MSPH, a Master's of Science in Public Health when I was in Miami. I think that's one of the real areas that we, we horrendously um, neglect here. Um, in the United States uh, is injury prevention. And part of that's just because everything is, is very fragmented. We have multiple hospital systems, we have multiple hospitals, but we don't have an encompassing healthcare system. And so uh, between driving, driving regulations, um, and again, those things are very alien for me. For example, the idea you can ride around on a motorcycle with no helmet on. I, I still struggle to get, get around that. I understand the personal freedoms, but um, there's, it's just common sense to me, you should wear helmet and protective equipment. Lack of seat belts. Um, there's one state in the union um, that doesn't have any seat belt laws. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's just, I, my mind can't get around that growing up um, where I grew up. Uh, but I know personal freedom is very important to people uh, and uh, it's a struggle sometimes to, to kind of balance that. Um, uh, I can't remember what you were, where you were going with that, sorry. No, you answered my question okay. exactly. It would be how, how did that extra degree impact the way you view patient care? And yeah. so well, part, part of our role here as trauma surgeons is actually to have an injury prevention uh, focus. Mm -hmm. um, here, it's primarily uh, working on uh, elderly people and falls. When I used to live in Arizona, we did work with um, uh, swimming pools, obviously uh, near drownings. Uh, we did uh, work on texting and driving. Uh, I mean, it, I didn't do it to you the other day, but when we have our, our talks in front of the students, I always get people to put their hands up and say if they text and drive, and the people who don't put their hands up are just lying, because um, we all do it. Um, so there, there, there are things that we can do that can significantly impact. One of the challenges I always have with, with talking to our residents is they talk about, oh, this person was in an accident. If you use the word accident, it implies that there's no modifiable risk factors which I could see if a meteorite falls down, smashes in the road in front of you, and you end up in a big crater. But most of the rest of the time, we're either picking MV, uh, motor vehicle crashes, we're either distracted, 
we're um, on our phones, we're driving too fast, we're not wearing a seatbelt, we're driving impaired. There's very few times where, where it's truly an accident. And that's kind of part of the, the, the lens through which you see things when you, when you do sort of injury prevention work. Very well said. Now, what would you say is the most unique part of your specialty? Uh, the most unique part? I wouldn't say it's necessary. Uh, uh, th this is a unique part in a in a bad way. Um, if I can if I can go to that, one of the unique things that that we that I sometimes struggle with is that we can be very busy and we can take a patient to the operating room, for example, or we can have a patient in the emergency department who's doing very poorly, and say, for example, we don't save them, unfortunately. Then we have to turn around and pivot, and in the next 15 minutes. We may be talking to a patient about doing a, uh, a, an appendectomy on them or doing another operation on them. And I think one of the things that, that is a unique, but not in a good way, I'm sorry, because I couldn't think of a good, good example on the spot there of unique in a good way, is that we, we have to be fairly resilient to be able to go from what is a very high pressure, high stress and sad situation and then immediately be able to pivot and move into something that's a completely different pace and still be able to provide good and compassionate patient care. That is difficult. The, the having to get right back on the horse after you've been thrown off again, um, as it were, can be, can be challenging. Yeah, and you mentioned some key characteristics of your field there. I always allow physicians to kind of sell their specialty like a car salesman. <laughs> so next question would be, why should someone choose trauma surgery? I think it's incredibly rewarding. I really think it is. Um, uh, there's, I bless their hearts. I don't. Uh, I I would struggle being a surgical oncologist because you're fighting cancer, and at the end of the day, cancer usually wins. Um, with me, I can have patients who come in who are really badly injured, and I can think they're going to do horribly, and they can turn around and surprise me. I remember very many years ago, not here. I had a patient who was going down hard on Christmas Day. They were, having, they were really sick, they had gone into renal failure, they had a terrible, terrible brain injury, um, and I really wasn't sure they were gonna survive. However, they eventually started pulling through, and then in um, March or April that year, I happened to be just wandering past our clinic, and the, the mother of this patient pulled me inside and said, hey, I don't know if you remember me, but this is, this is John. And this patient was, who had been at death's door basically three months earlier, was there walking, talking, they still have residual defects, um, but they were clearly doing much better. Um, and so I think that the, the, we do have a significant ability to pull patients back from the brink. Um, it doesn't take much sometimes with patients who are uh, significantly bleeding. All you, we have the ability to control that. We can take out their spleen, we can put our finger, we can ligate the, uh, the blood vessel. Um, and we get that, that gamut from young healthy patients all the way up to to older patients who are much more fragile, um, but we can do the whole thing. Okay. Now, turn it around. Why should someone not choose your specialty? Um, so I'm going to, again, answer that backwards. Um, one of the things that people always think about is lifestyle. So I don't want to be a trauma surgeon because I think it has a bad lifestyle. My wife says that to me all the time. I can't imagine why any woman would want to be a trauma surgeon. Um, and I, I don't think that's entirely fair. Um, to be honest, I think that now, particularly the way we work, we're actually able to have a much more controllable lifestyle. It's certainly possible, speaking to, the, to any uh, woman who wants to go into this field, to have children, have a career in, in trauma surgery. I really think it is. I think you have to, getting back to what I said before, you have to be willing to be knocked off the horse and get back on. You have to bear in mind that there are going to be patients who are going to have very poor outcomes and you're going to be able to have to be resilient enough to move on from that and take care of the next patient. That doesn't mean that you're not going to be compassionate or providing compassionate care, um, but the, uh, you do have to have that inner resilience um, to be able to, to work like that. It's also, it's a team sport. So if you like working with a team, if you like having a team and depending on other people, it's good. If you want to be the lone wolf, it's probably not the great specialty for you um, because you're, uh, although we th think of ourselves as the captain of the ship, 
really we're the captain of a ship only if everyone else is, is doing their job. We are very much dependent on, on, on everyone else. Um, you also have to be able to be very self-reflective. We spend an awful lot of time on performance improvement and peer review and looking at outcomes and uh, evaluating how we can do things better. So if you don't like that sort of self-criticism or even outside criticism, then it's probably not um, the right thing for you. But you can have, you can end up doing elective surgery, you can do ICU, you can do um, emergency surgery, you can do trauma, you can do injury prevention work, you can do research, you can do all these things. You just have to accept that your, your work day may go from something as crazy as cutting out a tiny lipoma on someone's arm to that night cracking someone's chest when they've been shot in the chest. It's, it's, it's this huge, huge variety. Some fantastic advice. Now, a fun question next. Okay. Are there any stereotypes about your field? Um, I think there probably are. Most of them come from, from ER. I, I always like to think of ER. Um, certainly the original couple, uh, uh, couple of um, uh, series where you had uh, George Clooney in there and, uh, uh, and the guy who, uh, Eric, um, oh, what's his name? I can't remember the name of the act, the African-American gentleman who played the, the trauma surgeon in that. Uh, and I just, I remember all sorts of crazy things like um, they would do an ED thoracotomy and clamp, cross clamp the aorta. Then they immediately kind of go, okay, the patient's stable, let's move him. So well, what are you talking about? That patient's not stable. You can't do anything crazy like that. So we, there is a certain, I think, a, a, a thought of, of A, cowboys. Um, B, I think is a, is a stereotype. Uh, B, we're, we're, we're thought of as a little shouty, frankly, a little, um, a little uh, hyper. Uh, a little high maintenance, um, and I, I think that's probably fairly fairly reasonable. We do expect we expect a lot. Um, we're we're in critical situations, and so if people aren't doing their jobs, then there could be very significant uh, consequences. Um, but it really depends on on your personality. I think there are there are nice and calm trauma surgeons, and there are unpleasant and unhappy uh, trauma surgeons. And that's pretty much I think probably true of, of uh, a lot of specialties. Okay. Now, you do work in an academic institution. So I do. What is your go-to question to ask your residents? My go-to question to ask about what in particular? About, um, oh, just a, a, a pimping question? Yes. Oh, oh, I've got so many. No, no, I can't. I haven't got, I haven't got one. I've got so many. It just depends on what the situation is. Um, but I'm, I, I will admit to people I worship at the Church of Evidence-Based Medicine. Okay, so evidence-based medicine is my thing. So I have, I was in awe when I was a, a student or resident of all these faculty who could remember, oh, you know, this paper published back in 1999 showed this, and these are the authors. I have become that, that faculty member. I have a very good memory of, of, uh, uh, of papers and, and academics and, and scientific studies. So usually my, my question will revolve, my pimping question will revolve around, do you think there's any data that supports what we're saying here? And then the residents all will have to go, mm. if you ask that question, probably yes, Dr. Oh, yes. And then they, they don't know it, so we use that as an educational thing. So I, I am a traditional Socratic questioner, uh, and uh, I do like that whole pimping thing. Good. Why don't we, um, why don't we kind of, uh, uh, I've got a nice chair there, if you don't mind, okay. I'm going to sit down, yeah. and then I can, you can, I even you, can look at, you can look at the pictures of my, of my uh, home region in the UK on the, uh, uh, in the yes. background there. Check and make sure you're... So it's still working? Yes, that's, that's yes. good. So what does an average day look like for you, which I know is a loaded question. It was well, not so much a loaded question, but it really it depends a little bit on what I'm doing. So um, if I'm in the ICU, my average day will involve uh, spending the first two to four hours of the day rounding, um, rounding with the residents. Um, I tend to do education as I round. So um, if we have a dozen patients, I'll be talking about all sorts of things in the ICU, event management, uh, nutrition or uh, all sorts of, um, uh, of other things and then um, come back to, the, to my office here, uh, work on charts um, and then as procedures need to be done I would go back over there to help with the procedures, excuse me, and any new admits and then we'll do afternoon rounds. So that would be an ICU week. Um, if I'm on call, um, what that generally involves around is waiting to see what new things happen but usually we have at least one or two or three or more cases booked for the OR. So an on-call day during the week would involve going to the operating room, going to see traumas as they come in, going to see consults, um, et cetera. And then we actually split floor rounds up completely. So if I'm on a, uh, on a week when I'm rounding on the floor, 
it would be going out and running. Floor rounds typically take the longest, that's usually three or four hours. Um, and then we have clinic uh, two or three times a week. But we, we compartmentalize things into, into different, uh, different roles um, so that we can make sure that no one else, no one's overwhelmed at any point. Teamwork. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Now we got some kind of rapid fire quick questions. Okay. Um, more on the lifestyle and maybe some of the more niche things that you do. So uh, first off, what is the most amount of patients you've ever seen in a day? Uh, 55, I think. That's, that's me. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it can be higher than that, but that's, I think that's what I've done. How many patients do you see on an average day? Uh, if you're talking about uh, admits or trauma patients coming in, and again, it depends on whether we're talking 12 or 24 hours, but uh, 24 hours, I think the, the most I've done is 30, 30 new consults and admits. Um, talking about floor rounds, again, it's, it's going to be like uh, uh, 30 to 50. What is the most difficult procedure you do? Uh, I don't like working down in the pelvis. <laughs> so if I'm putting, if I'm working on bowels down the pelvis, I would, actually that's not true. I, um, I would say probably for me, vascular surgery. My eyes are starting to get a little older. Um, I don't have loops anymore. So I don't enjoy vascular surgery anymore. So for me, I'm, I'm usually looking to try and get some help if, if I have a patient with a vascular surgery injury or vascular injury. What's the most common procedure you do? The most common procedure we do is probably, unfortunately, debridement, um, cutting off dead tissue. There is, are an awful lot of patients in this part of the world who are not cared for well, either at home or in nursing facilities. We see an inordinate number of pressure wounds, like uh, sacral decubitus, um, and patients who come in with uh, other kinds of, of wounds. So probably that's the most common thing we see, the uh, common th procedure I do, unfortunately. What is the most memorable case you've encountered so far? Oh, I still have memories of a case when I was a resident. It was a guy we did a, a pneumonectomy on. Um, and so he came in, had been uh, shot in the chest, and we rushed him straight to the operating room, and we ended up taking out his entire lung um, on the right-hand side. And the reason it was memorable because that, in general, carries about a 50% mortality rate. Um, but the guy survived and was, uh, went home. Um, Another memorable case from here recently was a guy who came in who was impaled on a fence post and had a fence post um, going all the way through his, his left shoulder, it was hold, held on my skin, basically destroyed his clavicle and missed his subclavian artery and vein by a millimeter. Um, so we had to actually get the, uh, the saw from facilities to, to shorten the, the, uh, the fence post off before we took him to the operating room. Oh my gosh. Uh, what is the toughest part of your job? Uh, the toughest part of my job, I think, is telling people that their loved one hasn't made it, um, particularly if they haven't been given any kind of uh, uh, in, uh, any kind of inkling, any kind of information about what's going on. So we'll have family members who just know that their loved one's been brought to the to the hospital, and they turn up and they don't know what's going on, what the injury, uh, what's happened, and then you have to go out from the operating room to to tell them that um, you weren't able to save their, their child, their mother, their brother, whoever it was. Um, that is, is always the hardest part. And that's never going to get better, unfortunately, for me. That's, that's, that's terrible. Mm -hmm. Well, let's kind of move to a more positive note. What is the most rewarding part of your job? Uh, I think seeing people get better and go home. I mean, that's what we're all here for. We're all here mm -hmm. to help patients and help them get better. Um, from a from a clinical standpoint is absolutely uh, seeing the patients recover get better make it out of the hospital hopefully to go home or, or even if it is going to rehab and then sometimes seeing them back in, in clinic excuse me when they've recovered um i am at work in an academic institution so i'm also pleased when i see things um, go well from an academic standpoint whether it's our residents getting into good fellowships papers getting accepted or published research projects going well um and i I do still enjoy some of the academic recognition from that standpoint, but primarily it's about the patients. Hmm. Now, quick fire kind of lifestyle questions, because I know you mentioned earlier, trauma surgery is kind of notorious for the lifestyle. So how many hours do you work in an average week? So if you average it out, I still think I work around a 60 hour week. 
Yeah. So 55 to 60 hour week, which honestly is, I remember reading a study um, about what attendees work back in the UK, and that's exactly the same as the attendees work back in the UK. Um, and I'm not sure it'd be that much different to uh, to various other surgical specialties. Mm -hmm. It's just that we probably work more weekends, um, frankly, um, and more nights than other people. One of the things we've done uh, with acute care surgery is we've taken over pretty much all the nighttime responsibilities of general surgeons in academic centers like, like here. So unless something goes wrong with one of the general surgeon's patients, um, by general surgeons here, I'm talking about the surgical oncology team, the minimally invasive team, et cetera, unless something goes wrong with one of the inpatients, they're very unlikely to be called in the middle of the night. And that's been a, a, a shift in how the model has gone um, in that we are the general surgeons now. Um, and so it's not true in everywhere, of course, in the smaller centers, that's not the case. But in most academic trauma centers, or well, particularly academic level one trauma centers, um, we will end up doing more night call from that standpoint. Um, but the hours I don't think are, are terrible. The problem is as surgeons, we, we get up early. That's the, I think that's the, my wife's biggest complaint. I mean, the other day, I, uh, I think on Tuesday, um, the, everyone in the house was still asleep, apart from the dog and I. Uh, the dog woke up when I woke up, and then I left the house at 6.30, and no one was awake. So we do get up early because the ORs start early. Well, you almost answered my next question, which is, what time do you normally wake up? Uh, I normally wake up at 5.45. Um, that's not ideal. I, luckily, I don't live that far away from the hospital. Um, residents and fellows usually have to wake up a little earlier than that to get here, but um, uh, I plan on getting to work at 7. I'm slow. I actually take more time getting ready to go to work in the morning than my wife does. Because um, between shower and sh shaving, it's the shaving. The shaving takes time if you don't want to cut yourself. Um, <laughs> but she's always able to get to work in less time than, than I am. Um, but I could do it at six. But there's, I'm one of these breakfast people. Okay, I mean, you know that that whole argument that Mark Wahlberg and Dr. Oz had in like 2019 or whatever it was. Um, I'm a Mark Wahlberg guy. Breakfast. Got to have breakfast when I leave the house. And if I could recommend anything to, to your to your viewers. If you're a surgery resident, have breakfast before you leave the house. Mm -hmm. And so I always do. So what time do you normally leave the hospital? Uh, I always have a, so I'm a slightly different person because I'm the division chief. So I always have, there is always more paperwork, always more emails to answer, always more things to do. Uh, honestly, I could sit in my office for a, uh, for a, a month and not even leave and I'd be fine. So I try to get out of here by five. But I'm also trying to be better about being home when my kids get home from school. So on weeks like this week where I don't have any clinical responsibilities and I've just finished night shift, I try very hard to um, get home so I can meet my kids off the school bus. So that's that, that I would leave here at 3.40 to be home by, by 4. Today, I'm leaving even earlier because I'm going for a haircut. Um, but yes, yeah, so on, on average, it's about, uh, realistically, on average, it's about a 10-hour day. How many hours of sleep are you typically working on? Um, so we do we do shifts. So that's the that's the big difference. One of the things that we instituted back in 29, uh, 2020, in fact, was a uh, a twelve hour shift, um, twelve hour day shift, twelve hour night shift. Um, which we're actually in the middle of publishing a paper on that about how that affected burnout and uh, and was basically uh, was a very good thing for the faculty. So when I'm on night shift, I come in, I start the week on Monday night, I stay up all night and then I try not to go to sleep on the subsequent nights. I just sleep during the day. And the same one on day shift, then we go home at night. So we don't have 24 hour calls anymore. So usually unless there's some problem at home, I'm sleep I'm I'm sleeping seven seven to eight hours. Seven hours I can do well on seven hours. If I get eight hours of interrupted sleep I'm great. But I'm I'm older so unfortunately I do, do that. I do have the nocturia thing getting up in the middle of the night to go pee, but um, I aim for eight and usually get a little less. How many hours of sleep are you working on right now? Uh, I think I'm fine. I went to what I. Uh, our problem is getting our kids to, to go to sleep. So I think our kids finally went to bed at ten past ten last night, and I was up at five forty-five. So, do the math, whatever that is. A little bit less than eight hours, seven and a half. Mm. And I know you kind of touched on this earlier, but do you have to take call? Yes. So we take uh, the way we have it right now. There's seven of us. We're a little short. We should be at eight, and in fact, we're approved to go to nine. Um, so our, the way we're running our schedule is that you, that means that basically once every seven weeks you do a week of nights. Um, so you don't do any other night call. Um, we do have backup though. So we do have to have uh, someone available in case 
there's too much work going on here and we have to call someone else in. So um, I think I've been called in once in the last couple of months as backup, um, but otherwise it's just those seven nights of call. Do you prefer night shift or day shift? I find day shift more tiring. Um, no one likes night shift in my family. We call it the dreaded night shift. So my wife doesn't like it, my kids don't like it. Um, I, I, it's the, the good thing about night shift is usually there's more downtime. So I can usually get some work done during the week, although never as much as I think I can. I can watch the occasional movie and things like that, and I don't feel guilty about watching a movie at work <laughs> when I'm on nights. Um, but I don't sleep, I make a deliberate point of not going to bed, because I think that's much better to, to flip your, um, your sleep-wake sleep cycle. So if I had to choose myself, I'd actually probably say nights, yeah. um, because I find days uh, more stressful in a way. If you pick, ask my family, they'd say the other way around. Mm. Now, how long does it take you to chart at the end of your day? Because I get varying responses from different specialties. So it depends what we're doing. Um, but usually, if I'm doing something that involves charting, I'm banking on about an hour a day. An hour, yeah, an hour a day or, or maybe a little more, but it's not. What I do when I'm in the ICU, for example, is I write my notes as I'm going along. So all I'm doing at the end of the day is cutting and pasting and signing. <laughs> um, but for example, I'm still, my, I've, for my night shift last week, I still have six charts to do. Um, my problem is, is I can't, I'm very, a little OCD in the way I write my, my notes. Um, and so that takes a little longer for the for, for these kind of notes we're talking about right now, the, the history and physicals. And so the lag time for that tends to be a little bit longer after my week of days or week of nights. Daily progress notes, I sign without fail before midnight on that day. I will not let them go to, a ne to the next day unless I'm literally running out of the hospital to go on, on vacation. So I'm, I'm very OCD about my notes. Kind of a wholesome question. Who are you most thankful for on your care team? Who am I most thankful for on my care team? Um, I'm going to have to probably say my trauma program manager. So, I mean, we, as the trauma medical director, I work very closely with my trauma program manager. She makes sure that we're on track for our site visit, which I have up there on the board, um, which is coming in 2023. Make sure we're working on our PI projects, making sure all the T's are, uh, are crossed and the I's are dotted. Um, and so she's the, uh, she's the person I'm really um, going to lean on the most. And having said that, I'm going to also say my partners. I have some very good partners. What you need to do, need to be able to do, is is you need to be able to rely on the people who are coming behind you. I remember talking to a colleague of mine back in Phoenix many years ago, and he basically said that although he was in a group, any patient of his that landed up in the ICU, he basically had to then manage 24 hours a day for the rest of that time they were there because none of his partners really wanted to have anything to do with his mm -hmm. patients, or they didn't have that kind of group practice. So if you work in a group practice and you have reliable partners, it's golden. Yeah. So, kind of a story time, and we'll try to keep it brief, but what is the most complicated case you've encountered so far? The most complicated case I've encountered? Um, what I can think of a very complex case that we had in my last, um, before I came here to, uh, to Augusta, it was a lady who was a good Samaritan, she had pulled over the side of the road to help somebody push their car. Somebody didn't see her and basically rammed her from behind, causing both her legs to get pretty much amputated, um, as well as causing multiple other injuries, including burns. Um, and we spent, uh, we took her to the operating room, we worked on her. She died a couple of times on the table. Um, we had to open her belly, we had to deal with her lungs, she had a brain injury, she had burns, she had multiple fractures. Um, and she was a survivor, um, and it was, uh, it was quite phenomenal, um, honestly, because usually when you have a patient who dies uh, or has cardiac arrest from, uh, after blood trauma, it's very difficult to get them back. Um, and so uh, she was one of the more complex patients I've looked after. Okay. Now, what is the most common medical advice you give to your patients? Uh, common medical advice I give to my patients? That's a, um, I think it's more about mobilizing. It's more about giving them, uh, uh, making sure that they're uh, not just sitting around. Um, so one of the, the, the things that people don't realize about recovering from surgery is that the more time you actually get up and move, 
the better it is. It's better for your lungs, it's better for your bowels, it's better for, for everything. Um, and so there's a certain group of people who very much adopt the sick roll and won't move or just you go in and say, is there anything else I can do for you? And they'll ask you to fluff their pillow or get them a Coke from the, from the, uh, the thing or cover their toes because they're cold. Um, and I worry about those patients because they're clearly going to expect to be waited on hand and foot, whereas the secret to recovering um, quickly and well is, is kind of pushing yourself to a certain extent, making sure you get up out of bed. And you're, if, as long as you're not thinking about patients who have fractures and are non weight bearing but getting up and moving around, um, and so trying to motivate people to do that is probably the most common uh, piece of advice. And also helping patients realize that they're not going to be pain-free, unfortunately. Um, there is pain associated with injuries, um, and we can't abrogate it. And if we do try and completely um, get rid of it, then we're going to end up causing even more opiate addiction than we are already seeing. All right. So we've talked a lot about your life inside the hospital now. How about your life when you clock out? So what is your favorite thing to do when you're not working? Uh, hang out with my kids. Um, I don't really have significant hobbies right now. I used to do a lot of bicycling, but um, I kind of vacillate between it. It gets too cold here and then it gets too hot. Um, but I do, I do go out on my bicycle uh, a bit. I like um, cycling on the, the Augusta Canal, uh, the, the towpath there. Um, but no, it's mostly hang out with my kids. I have a seven-year-old and a 10-year-old, um, and they are, they are lots of fun. Uh, as I mentioned before, we, we started uh, filming. I have a, uh, a six-month-old puppy that I completely surprised my family with. Um, so I've got a lot of work to do with uh, uh, on the puppy and training him. But it's hanging out home. I have a very nice house. I have a great existence um, at home, and that's that's been one of the things that's uh, been a, a major boon in coming here to Augusta. Is that um, our family life has really uh, blossomed. That's so good to hear. Now, what is your favorite place in the world uh, to visit? Uh, my wife's from Brazil, so Brazil has a very soft spot in my uh, uh, in my mind. But also, I I love if you're talking about cities, I say Barcelona is probably one of my favorite cities. Um, I love France. I have visions of retiring in France, uh, even though my wife and I have different opinion on that matter. But um, uh, probably France and and, uh, uh, and Brazil, and of course, uh, obviously, I like going back home to Britain when I can. But um, we had planned to go in December for Christmas, but then Omicron put pay to that, so. Uh, does your family ever ask you for random medical advice? No, um, well actually that's not, that's, that's actually not true. My wife is a physician, and despite the fact that she's a physician, anything medical that happens in the house with our kids, it's always, uh, it's always for me to, to, to figure out and decide. So um, yes, I have, I have been asked for, and I've been texted pictures of, of people's cuts and said like, so I had one friend in my last job who used to, um, uh, when I lived in Arizona, she used to do a lot of mountain biking. And what she would do, she would text me pictures of her injuries, usually a week late after she had been neglecting them, and said, what should I do now? And I said, well, you should have had it taken care of when you ha had the injury. I don't know what to do now, but yes, I do get, it's not so much my family, but it's, uh, it happens on occasion. Uh, well, that kind of answers the next question. What's the weirdest question a family or friend has ever asked you, medical related? <laughs> It's usually it's usually been about wounds or, or things like that, mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, I'm I'm very I try and be very clear. For example, like anything about a rash, you want to ask me about. I don't do rashes. I'm not a dermatologist. I absolutely don't do uh, don't do rashes or anything like that. And and honestly, I I try and keep myself away from being the kind of person who does stuff at home. There's there's a one of our neighbors is an ER physician, and he's always helping stitch up someone's kid or something like that. I was like, no, that's not me. If you have any problems with that, I can tell you where to go. I'll help you go there. But I'm not stitching up someone's, uh, uh, someone's hand on, a, on my kitchen table. Yeah, it's always the ER physician, and the amount of times uh, people have responded with uh, just weird pictures that they get sent is, yes. it's too funny. <laughs> yeah. Now, what is your favorite animal, not a dog or cat? Uh, I am a herpetologist. So I love snakes. I had an eight foot long African rock python when I was in medical school. Um, oh. So I like snakes. And uh, we're actually going to, my son is going to be trying to persuade his mother to let him get a lizard and we'll be going to one of the reptile shows this year. Oh. So yeah, reptiles are my thing. Reptiles, amphibians, insects, love okay. all those things. Not a great mammal person. Yeah. Now, if you could have dinner with anyone in history, who would it be? Ooh. 
Oh, gosh, I wasn't expecting that question. Uh, I know I'm a scientist, so it'd probably be somebody uh, scientific, Charles Darwin or, um, or Albert Einstein, uh, someone like that. It would probably be someone um, uh, from that side of things. I'd probably have to think about that for a, uh, uh, for a while to come up with a really... If I only had one person, it wouldn't be someone historical. It wouldn't be a politician or a, or a political leader or a, a king or a queen or thing like that. It would most likely be a scientist. What would you guys be eating at that dinner? Well, I'm vegetarian, so uh, we'd probably be uh, uh, certainly something without meat, <laughs> uh, which would probably they would find abhorrent. Um, I don't know though, who is it? There were some very there's some very famous vegetarians. Oh, of course. Now hold on, I'm thinking of the world's worst famous vegetarian, Adolf Hitler, which is not that's definitely not somebody <laughs> I want to have dinner with. Uh, uh, I don't know, salad maybe. Boring salad. Simple but safe answer. Yes. Uh, what is your favorite dish to eat? Um, my favorite dish to eat, bread and cheese, honestly. Uh-huh. I, I, I grew up in a, um, you've heard of cheddar cheese, obviously, right? Mm-hmm. So cheddar gorge is where cheddar cheese came from initially, and that is about uh, an hour and 45 minutes from my house. So there's an awful lot of good cheddar in my part of the world in back in the UK. Um, and so just a cheese and pickle sandwich would be, a, uh, and that's not American style pickles, that's Branson pickle, which is like a chutney. So cheese and pickle sandwich, that would be my favorite food. Very simple. No. Coffee, tea, or soda? Tea. Absolutely tea. I'm totally British in that sense. Uh, I love this question because I always get something different from every doctor. How much water should you be drinking every day? As much as you feel thirsty. You know, this whole, you have to drink this much water, is like, you have thirst receptors for a reason. It's- Your body's probably pretty smart. They've got thirst receptors, and if you drink too much, your kidneys are pretty smart too, and they'll pee it out. So if you're thirsty, go drink some water. If you're not, don't worry about it. Forcing yourself to drink a certain regulated amount of water is just ridiculous. What's the science behind that? See, evidence-based medicine. There's no science behind that whatsoever. Well, that's the answer I uh, co-signed to. (laughs) uh, Favorite meal from the hospital cafeteria, if you have one? I suppose Taco Tuesday, the taco ball on Taco Tuesday. If you're going to push me. I said if you have one. I've had people say Abs- there's nothing in there. that." <laughs> it's either Taco Tuesday or it's the, uh, the, um, the Black Bean Burger, neither of which are particularly impressive. <laughs> okay. so, are there any artistic hobbies you keep up with? Artistic hobbies? N- uh, no, not really. Nothing. Um, I wish I did do more on the kind of arts front. Um, no, I mean, I, this needs to be used. I, I have, I'm tone deaf. I can't play an instrument. Um, uh, it's been a long time since I've tried to draw paint. I like art, as you can tell. These are these are pictures of uh, uh, of the the countryside around my uh, close to my where I grew up. This literally I used to is like a mile and a half from my house. Um, I used to ride up the hill to get to. Um, that's a little further, but that's the river I grew up. And I used to fish on that river um, when I was growing up, a little trout stream. Um, but no, I'm not artistically inclined anymore. I'm afraid. Favorite kind of music to listen to in the OR. Uh, well, I like dance electronic music, so trance music. Um, I try not to force people to listen to that, though, because I think that's a little mean. So when, when p- if people ask, I usually will pick something fairly safe like Rihanna or Shakira or even Hits of the 80s. No, you can't go wrong with Hits of the 80s, right? Yeah, I agree with that. Your favorite music album of all time? Uh, my favorite music album of all time is probably... Um, the album Love by a band called The Cult, which is kind of like a gothic punk rock band from the UK back in the, uh, in the 80s. But that's mostly because I have a lot of um, very good memories of things I was doing when I was listening to, listening to the songs. Oh, your favorite song of all time? Revolution from that album. Hmm. What's one random task you wish you could be better at? One random task I wish I could be better at? Uh, it's not a random task. This is a bit being a little more broad. I wish I was not so much of a procrastinator. So I do have, that is, I, it's a failing of mine. I know it's a failing of mine. I sometimes dress it up and say, no, I'm not procrastinating. I'm just trying to gather information before I make a decision. But in the reality, a lot of the time, it's actually just procrastination. I wish I wasn't so much of a procrastinator. I think I, if I would do better, if I was more of an action taker, um, still consider things and not do things, um, as it were, rashly, but um, actually sometimes getting off my my tushy and doing what I need to do would be useful. What is the best way that you relax after a long day? Um, 
this is going to sound so stupid. I like scrolling through Facebook. <laughs> I like I like seeing. It's not just about seeing what's on there. I, I get I get a lot of news, unfortunately, through Facebook. I, I mean, I, I was doing this last night. I was lying on my couch. I had my big iPad Pro out. I was scrolling through Facebook and scrolling through news. I like to read the equivalent, I suppose, of a newspaper. I like to know, I like to be well informed. In the UK, I would actually read a newspaper. If, when I was back there, I used to read a newspaper called The Guardian, which was a kind of a, a left-wing, Democrat-leaning um, newspaper. Here, I cannot abide the printed media, um, I have to say, and I'm not very, and I, there's no way I could sit down and watch CNN or Fox or any of those things. Um, and so I, I kind of curate my own news by going through the Apple News app and, and Facebook. So are you a night in or go out on the town kind of person? Night in these days. I've got kids. <laughs> Indoors or outdoors? <sighs> Depends on the weather. <laughs> That's good I, don't, I don't like being hot and sticky. In general, I would say outdoors. Um, to be honest, I grew up in, as you can see, I grew up in the countryside. I like being outdoors. But I, um, I spent, just spent 11 years of my life before I moved here in Arizona. And in June, July, and August, you literally could not go outdoors um, because it was like, oh, it was 116 degrees two years in a row on my birthday in June. Like, no, I'm not going out in that. Um, here, it's not so bad. It's just sticky. But as long as you're, it's, it's not bad. We're actually in the middle of, of redoing our patio so that we can spend more time outdoors next summer, putting fans in, putting shutters in so we don't get blinded by the sun. But yeah, in general, outdoors. Beach or mountains? Mountains every time, which is a problem because my for my wife it's beach 100% of the time. So we have to. Uh, I'm trying to persuade her to let me take the family skiing in Sugar Mountain in a couple of weeks, but that's a that's a work in progress. Would you consider yourself? Uh, would you consider yourself more of an introvert or an extrovert? Introvert. And do you think that personality trait was a factor in you choosing your specialty? No, I've actually had to be more of an extrovert, unfortunately. I think it's hard to be an introvert and a surgeon because people are looking to you for leadership, usually. Um, and you have to have a certain presence, I think, as a surgeon to be able to instill confidence in patients. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, it, you can be a, a surgeon and introvert, I just think it's harder. And I think that you have to, I certainly have more of a confident, booming personality now than I did when I was in medical school. I was much more introverted in medical school, I would say. All right. And now we're getting close to the end. Only a few more questions no left. But these will be some pretty reflective questions. Okay. So the first one being, what did you think you were going to be when you grew up as a kid? Um, so what I wanted to be was I wanted to be a zoologist discovering new species of, um, of butterflies and insects in the Amazon jungle. Um, I figured after a while that was probably, A, not very useful um, in terms of overall usefulness to humanity, and B, I thought that, well, all the, all the, um, all the species have been uh, discovered right now. There's nothing left to discover, I mean, because you've now got how many thousands of insects, etc. So funny story, I was in medical school, in the second year of medical school, and I went to the local botanical gardens in Edinburgh, very beautiful Victorian botanical gardens, and I noticed an exhibition of photographs on. So I went to the exhibition of photographs, and it was an exhibition of photographs by two zoologists who were discovering new species in the Amazon jungle, and funnily enough, they were just a couple of years older than me. So I went, damn it, I could have done what I wanted to do. And then I went, yeah, but I'm pretty happy doing what I'm doing, and I'm always going to have job security. So, <laughs> is there a different specialty you think you could have done? Um, yes, I think that, but that, I think that depends on. So, just before I came to the U.S., really for good, um, my mother got diagnosed with ovarian cancer, and it was a big discussion for me because I'd been accepted back into a residency program after already having come here for one year and left, um, and it was a big discussion between her and I about whether I would come back or whether I would stay there. And in the end, she was very supportive and said, listen, I've lived my life. You need to live yours. You need to make your decisions. You need to make your plan for your future. Um, and I don't, I don't regret that. However, I do sometimes wonder if I should have stayed and if I had done things differently. Um, if I had, I probably would have tried to become a laparoscopic or minimally invasive surgeon. In the UK, that's not so much bariatric surgery like it is here. Um, but that would be more sort of foregut surgery and other things. So I certainly think I could have done something else. I would enjoyed anesthesia. Um, part of the reason I didn't do it in the UK is that anesthesia in the UK, is, it's a really tough exam, and it's all about physics, and I hate physics. Mm. <laughs> um, it's all about sort of 
um, linear displacement of gas and Boyle's law and Laplace's law and stuff like that. And I would have I would have not had a good time with that exam. But could I have done something else? Yes. If you didn't do medicine, what do you think you'd be doing right now? Well, I'd like to think I was doing something on that zoological front. Um, but as I've got older, I, I, I don't know. I think I, there's all sorts of things that you, um, I could be doing. Uh, I think the struggle we have now is that a lot of people get turned off by medicine because medicine is a lot more constrained than it was before. I mean, I, I, I don't know if you've ever read any of these books about how medicine was back in the day. Um, even here in the, in the U.S., there's a great book called The Horse and Buggy Doctor about a family practice doc who used to go and do his house calls in a horse and buggy. And my father grew up doing house calls. My, the general practitioners back in these days would get called in the middle of the night and they'd have to go out and do house calls, um, which is clearly has some major lifestyle <laughs> uh, limitations. Um, but I think you've got to find something that's, that's uh, rewarding. Um, what would I do outside of medicine? I have become a little bit more fascinated by finance over the last 10 or 15 years. So I don't know, maybe I would have I would try to pick something like that. That's very different to the 25-year-old me who was in medical school, I'd like to point out. Mm -hmm. So that's, this is me 27 years later. The 25-year-old me in medical school would have um, had a very different opinion about someone who was working in, the, in Wall Street or the stock market or, uh, uh, or um, the city in the UK. Now, everybody knows whatever field you go into in healthcare, it's difficult. So were there any times that you doubted you would make it as a physician? Not as a physician, no. I never doubted I would make it as a physician. I did doubt sometimes whether coming to the U.S. was possible or and or going to happen. I remember the first time I applied for surgical residency, I got three interviews. The second time I applied for surgical residency, I got one interview. And that's applying to literally like 170 programs around the country. And there were some places that were very, very close to foreign medical graduates. Like, for example, Duke. I, uh, I applied to Duke and they basically said, you're an FMG. We're not even going to bother. We're, we just we mm. don't do anything with FMGs. Um, and so it, when you're coming from overseas and trying to get into the U.S., that can be very uh, difficult. I always had a backup. I was a pretty good medical student in the UK, I always had an option to go back to the UK. So my issue was just, was I going to make it here mm. um, as opposed to whether... Well, now, I didn't have the easiest time of getting into medical school, but I, I did manage to overcome that and, and go into medical school. And again, if I hadn't gone to medical school, I had good grades, I would have got into something um, and I could have maybe uh, transferred. So I was I was very driven. I, I had the advantage of, I decided at the, about the age of 15, I had a vision. I had a plan, um, and so um, that worked well for me and has worked well for me up until now. Now I'm not sure. I've, I regard myself as being terminally differentiated, to use a sort of a, an evolutionary term. I'm a division chief of trauma. I don't plan on being a chair. I don't plan on being a president. I don't plan on being anything else other than this. Um, so I've, as far as I'm concerned, I've reached my, my own self-imposed glass ceiling. Uh. If you could change one thing about the medical field right now, what would it be? If I could change one thing about the medical field. It's hard to know whether to, to talk about the burden of documentation um, and the electronic health record, or whether to talk about the the back aspect of that, which is the burden of um, the kind of the the regulations that are, that are placed upon us. Now, a lot of those regulations are well-meaning, but there's a lot of stuff that's being you're being forced to tick boxes and um, do things that don't necessarily impact patient care. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, our big I think our biggest challenge to patient care right now is is staffing, whether it's physical therapy, whether it's nurses, whether it's having enough physicians. Um, and we're all spending increasing amounts of time, you brought it up yourself, about uh, on, on documentation. The, uh, Barack Obama and, and Joe Biden came up with this wonderful idea many years ago about meaningful use and encouraging all these people to, to, um, to get involved with electronic uh, documentation. And it, in theory, it sounds like a great plan. The implementation of it has been a disaster. And that, 
I have to say, is probably contributing to physician burnout more than any other one single factor, at least up until COVID. Now we have other things to complain about. Now, yeah, there's so many people that probably want to be in your shoes. I've gotten a couple comments, wanting specifically a trauma surgeon. Okay. So what can a medical student do right now to prepare to go into your specialty? So um, although it's become very difficult with COVID, one thing I would do is I would say shadow. Go and, go and hang out on a Friday night in the emergency department. Go, go hang out at times that, aren't, that are a little weird. So go on a Saturday night, go on a Friday night, go on a Sunday afternoon, hang out with, with some trauma surgeons, see what it looks like. See if you really want to do that because sometimes you walk into the emergency departments and there are people screaming blue bloody murder. There are people swinging at doctors and nurses. There are people who are, have major psychiatric disorders. Um, and those patients also get into trauma. We have a not significant population of people here who come from the local prisons and jails who have ingested foreign objects or inserted foreign objects um, in themselves. Do you feel like you want to be looking after that kind of patient at 2 o'clock in the morning on a Friday or Saturday night? If that's something that just completely turns you off, then you've got a great opportunity to say, you know what, I should, I could look at something else. If you like the excitement of never knowing what's coming through the door, and in this place it's even more never knowing because our paging system is not sophisticated enough, all we know is it's blunt versus penetrating and they're sick. I don't know what I'm getting until I literally walk down to the emergency, bay, emergency room. It may be I, I get level one, and then I'll say, it'll say penetrating. That could be a stab wound, it could be a gunshot wound, it could be a graze, it could be something really significant. I don't know. So you'll get a flavor for that. Um, and then if you decide that's really what you want to do, then there are multiple um, other ways to get involved. Find your local trauma surgeons and get going with some research with them. You want to start buffing up your CV to make sure you're going to get into a good surgery residency. Bear in mind that you're going to have to do a residency. You can then start thinking about where do I want to do my residency. If I do my residency in, um, uh, to pick a spot, Spartanburg, South Carolina, um, I'm not going to get a lot of necessarily a lot of exposure to trauma. If I do my residency in Miami or Los Angeles, I'm going to get a lot of exposure to trauma. Um, and so you can start sort of planning that career if you if you want to. Most it's an unfortunate fact of life that most academic medical centers have a significant amount of trauma. We are, as a whole, a rather violent society, and we um, also don't behave in the way we should. We drive too fast, we drive drunk, we don't wear our seatbelts, um, and so most academic medical schools will see a lot of trauma. So you don't have to don't feel I'm saying you have to go work in New Orleans, Miami, or Los Angeles, all the violent places. Um, you're going to probably get a pretty good exposure wherever you go. Sure. Now, if you were to go back, would you change any of your experiences that got you to where you are right now? Uh, that's a bit of a loaded question because if I changed any of my experiences, I wouldn't be where I am and I wouldn't know the people I know. So, for example, if I hadn't gone to Miami for my trauma fellowship, I wouldn't be married to the wonderful woman I'm married to today. Um, if I hadn't uh, um, gone to OHSU, I wouldn't have, uh, have got necessarily had that interest in trauma. So uh, if I were the different paths I could have taken, yes. Would they have ended me up here? Probably not. I would have done something different. But I don't think I'm going to, sp I think there's a lot of point to spend a lot of time regretting decisions you've, you, uh, that I've made in the past. Um, I tried to get uh, my fellowship in Miami was second choice to the one I, I wanted, but it worked out very well. Um, so no, I don't, I don't think I, I have huge regrets about where I am, uh, the, the path I took to get me here. All right. Well, finally made it, question 73, last one. So what would you say to the aspiring trauma surgeon right now? I would say it's a very good field to go into, isn't it, you're gonna have great job security. The only reason you would ever be to be unemployed is if you want to be yourself. It's, uh, there's always plenty of, uh, of people um, uh, around who want trauma surgeons. Um, you do have to uh, bear in mind that you're, you will need a team. So if you want to be a small town surgeon uh, in a rural town, it's probably not going to be, uh, you're not going to have the opportunity to make use of the skills you're going to learn going through general surgery residency and a trauma fellowship. Um, but you don't necessarily have to be in that big of a town. Um, I don't know, 
what the size of Augusta truly is, but it's 250,000 plus, um, and we have a level one trauma center. So uh, you can, uh, or you can end up living in somewhere like New York. New York has multiple trauma centers. Um, so you always have, you have choice of where you want to work and how you want to work. Um, I think it's very rewarding. It is tough. Um, you're gonna have to be resilient. Um, it doesn't necessarily uh, work well with a, very, with a completely fixed um, schedule. So for example, there are some, uh, when I was uh, finishing up my residency, I sat down and had lunch with one of the, um, the general surgeons in private practice and I said, explain to me how your life works. Um, and he basically said, well, I'm on call every Tuesday and every fourth weekend. So that was his life. Every Tuesday he knew he was on call for 24 hours and every fourth weekend he was on call. Our lives are not like that. They're not quite as regimented as that. Um, but if you have an ability to roll with the punches, you want to have a very varied practice um, and you don't mind working hard and the corollary of that is you get paid well, um, then it's a great career. Well said. Uh, that's all I have for you, Dr. Keith. Thank you so, so much uh, for your time. I know you're very busy. Uh, there will be plenty of students that uh, are incredibly inspired by your stories. Thank you, Andy. No, no worries. Happy to do this for you. Wait, before you click away, if you are a current student interested in pursuing a career as a surgeon, I have a very, very special opportunity for you. The goal of the 73 question interview series has always been and still is being able to give students all around the world exposure into some of these medical fields that right now they may not be able to have access to due to COVID restrictions or maybe you can't find the right mentorship for you. That's where the sponsor of today's video, Vivo Surgery, comes in. Vivo Surgery is a brand new and quickly growing service that allows students from anywhere around the world to tune in virtually during live surgical procedures, yes, live, to be able to learn from surgeons and ask them questions in real time. Now, I've been in a bunch of ORs and sometimes even being there live, it's really hard to see what's going on. The amazing thing about Viva Surgery, because I actually was invited to a VIP event for them to let me try out their service, is that you get a really high quality, low latency point of view of what the surgeon's seeing. I got to see a neurosurgical procedure, there's orthopedic procedures that have been showcased, and if I'm being honest, I can see more on these live streams than I could when I attended some of these procedures live, in person. Not just that, but these surgeons know you're there to learn and so you can chime in and ask questions in real time, they can hear you and you can see them literally explaining what they're doing, what anatomy you're looking at and special considerations at each step of the procedure. Vivo Surgery was allowing students to get almost one-on-one -on -one mentorship with a surgeon that is quite honestly unparalleled to anything that has been offered before from any service out there currently on the market. I know more than most people that early exposure into some of these niche specialties is the way to decide if it's right for you. And there are many of you who cannot get access to witnessing surgery procedures right now due to COVID. So I've teamed up with Vivo Surgery to give you guys a chance to get into one of these VIP streamings. If you are a current student looking to pursue a surgical specialty or even gain some mentorship from a surgeon, go to vivosurgery.com or use the links in the description to sign up for the waitlist for your chance to get into one of these VIP live streams. Spaces are extremely limited, and as you can imagine, these surgeons' times are very, very valuable, so they're looking for the best and brightest to be in these so that their time is worthwhile and you learn the most that you can. Again, this is open to students everywhere around the world because it is virtual, so if you want to be a surgeon one day and you want some one-on-one -on -one mentorship with surgeons as well as early exposure to real-time surgical procedures, click the link down below and sign up for one of these live streams. I promise you, you will not regret it. And thank you Vivo Surgery for sponsoring today's video.